What I want to talk about today is something kind of special because it's a talk that I've never really given and it's a lot of stuff that I've never really written, taught, you know, I've never really written any of it down. It's only really been anecdotes. So what do I want to talk about? Well, it's the thing that I've actually been doing with, you know, at least a, a third of my time, um, which has always kind of been like this, ah, it's not quite mathematics. But, you know, there is a phrase of repeated from Alan, which I guess you heard earlier today that it was repeated to someone else as well, that, you know, mathematical software development implies that there's some math going on. You know, his, you, know you have to say, oh, it implies there's some math going on. <laughs> you know, you have to the little chuckle, right? And uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and tell me why it's interesting, right? And so, you know, when I first, when I first took that instructorship over at MIT, I was kind of scared with some of this open source software stuff because you know you get a lot of advice that's like, oh, is software development really math? Is software development really math? You know, and Alan just said it's 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 interesting. Just keep doing it. Someone will care someday. You know, and uh, so I want to show you is the stuff that I found really interesting. Um, that and I, and I wanted to then lead you to where it actually ended up doing something that was pretty impactful. So my core point here is that developing good mathematical software for differential equations it requires exploiting theoretical knowledge, but also extrapolating and mixing in some empirical data. There's, there's the part that's math, and then there's the part that's like, everyone wants to shy away from, because it's just like weird, practical stuff, you know? And, it, and it's, but it's also really fun to think about how, how to do that in a principled way. So, so what brought me to the differential equation problem? Well, in, in 2019, when I was just starting at MIT, this was the core one on my mind. This is the nonlinear mixed effects models that we were building inside of something that's now called Pumas, right? So nonlinear mixed effects is something that is used within pharmacometrics. And the whole point at a general idea is that you have covariates, so things are easily measurable, which gives you parameters of a differential equation and then which gives you dynamics. And there is this kind of problem that you're trying to do here of finding the parameters of this structural model in some principled way. I don't want this to be a pharmacometrics top, so I'm going to kind of keep it there. But the whole point of this is that this kind of model really only makes sense for very small ODEs, usually like you know two ODEs, five ODEs. They call it a huge model if it's six ODEs. And so everyone says, like, oh, six ODEs? This is a solved problem. Why do you care so much about this? And what I hope what I hope I can do within the next 30 minutes is show you that I, I think that it's still, you know, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I still don't think it's not a solved problem. And I think that there's a lot, I think we're way away from doing this effectively. So first things first, let's let's start at the baseline, you know. What is the simplest ODE solver methods that you can do if you want to solve some small ODEs? Well, the first one's Euler's method, right? You just uh, take your, what your derivative is and you step forward by some delta T H thing, right? You know, everyone knows Euler's method, and you also know that its local truncation error is, you know, O H squared, um, which uh, I'm showing you this first term here because that first term will become important. But you know, you can say, well, that's just the first method, and you know, you tell all of your undergraduates, like, okay, but the, the, you don't want to use Euler's method. There's things that are better. What's the first one? Midpoint method. You just do Euler's method twice. There you go. You're good, right? Now, it, Euler's uh, it doesn't really do anything because you know, if you look at this order trunc this truncation error, you know. If you half your, the, the delta t for your method, then you're also going to, you know, take you're going to use twice as many f evaluations, but you also get uh, you also get one eighth the error, which is only half the error of uh, of Euler's method. So you really haven't done any better. Right? So if you look at it in terms of like, oh, I want to count how many times I have to call f because you know, how many times I evaluate my ODE is the expensive part, you know, you're really looking at it as like, ah, this order didn't actually do anything. Right? Because if I, if I decrease my order, I, I also have to do more work. You know, I have to do two f calls. And so I really need this to be done in a way that instead pans out over the big run. Right? And so this is where you, you get to, you know, you know, so this is this is where a lot of uh, undergrad numerical analysis courses will stop, and then they'll say this is uh, Rangakata's fourth order method. You know, it has a local truncation error of you know the next term beyond four is h to the fifth, and there you go. If you if you half your delta t, you get 32, you know, 32 times less error. But you only did four function evaluations, so this thing is absolutely great. Use Rangakata's fourth order method, right? But of course that can't be the end of the story because you know, that you get an exponential improvement for more orders, right? You know, you're, you're changing an exponent when you just do one f evaluation more. So why don't you just keep doing this, right? Why don't we just use a hundredth order ODE solvers? Like that sounds pretty good, right? Um, 
So where, where you can start to try to, you know, so the first thing that everyone starts to think about is how do I start to develop something so that way I can get a hundredth order, right? You know, it sounds like it's the cool thing to do. So what you, what you do is you start to say, well, instead of having something of this structure, or instead of having this exact algorithm, let's keep the structure, right? The structure is, you know, F of things I've had before equals K, you know, F of things I've calculated before, which is K1 and Y, this is K2, F of things I've calculated before, which is K1 and K2, but K1 here has a zero, right? You, you take what you had before, you put it into F, you get your next K. What you had before, you put it into F, you get your next K. And this structure is something that you can then say is a rung a, a kind of method, right? So it's a, it's a method where you take what you've calculated before, you stick it back into F, you do this enough times, and then you do a linear combination of all these Ks. Right, so this is then the general runga kata method, and it just becomes a, a problem of find out which values within this matrix, what values for the coefficients you should put into this algorithm, right? And so in this style, if you you know to kind of get a feel for the runga, uh, for the runga kata tableaus, you know here is the fourth order runga kata method, right? You know here we have uh, well the, this has the zero, so you always kind of have this trivial one to start. But here we have a uh, one half of the k one. That's what this one half means, and then zero of k one, one half of k two. There you go. Uh, zero of k one, zero of k two, one of k three. There you go. So you, it's it's basically just saying now, a runga kata method is a bunch of these coefficients slapped together, right? And so if we want to get something that's higher order, because I said oh things get exponentially better with higher order, well. We now have a method to be able to do this. And, and I think this, this is actually something that went on Stack Overflow right when I was starting to work on OD, ODE solver methods. And I, I want to tear this apart, actually. Not even just this, but also the answers that came to it. Because a lot of people are really confused by why we do not just use a higher order method. And I want to really walk through the difference between math and actually doing computation and why it leads to the, the, these, uh, these issues. Right? Because you know, someone says here, hey, someone came up with a 14th order, you know, 12th order Runge-Kutta method. Why do we just not use that all the time? Why does every software use fifth order? Why does it use eighth order, right? What's going on? So when I first started learning Runge-Kutta methods, I, I learned you know, this, this, one piece of, uh, this one piece that led me to believe that we knew an answer to this. right? And the reason for this is that you can prove that if you want a pth order method, you know, so let's say you want a fifth order method, then the minimum number of stages or the minimum number of f evaluations that's required is six. And so if you look at this, you see, oh, as I start increasing the order, uh, it's only linear in the, you know, you only need a same number of Fs to get the same order until fourth order, and then you actually start having to take more F evaluations in order to get more order. And it goes, oh, so that's why we stop around four or five. But then you think about it a second time, and you're like, okay, that actually made no, no sense at all. Because uh, the, the improvement due to order is exponential. It's the exponential on your error. And so, you know, why don't do, doing twice as many F evaluations? Uh, it, you know, it's still going. To, you know, it, it, that's but you get four more in order. Like that's that's a good win right there if you're looking at order. So this this is kind of an oft repeated explanation. In you know, I've even heard in graduate numerical analysis classes. So I you know, once I started to think about it more, I was like, well, no, that's not right. So, so the frame, I think that the issue is that the framing of order of convergence is misleading. And the reason is because you don't actually care about how good a method is when dt goes to zero. You care about how good a method is when dt is as large as possible. Right? You know, you, what, what you're trying to do when you're solving an ODE is you say, I want to solve the ODE until I get over here. Well, what is the biggest delta t that I can choose such that I could spend the least time doing work to solve this equation? Which is the exact opposite problem of the analysis, which says, how good is a method when delta t is as small as possible? And so when you start to put these thing, two things together, you start to see, well, order is something to kind of keep in mind for how good an algorithm is doing in terms of error. But that order matters more when delta t gets smaller. It matters less when delta t gets larger. Right? So what happens instead when, when your delta t is larger? What, what matters more? Well, what matters more is, you know, so this is why when I wrote out the, the error of the, of the uh, Euler method, I kept this first term here. Right? Because what actually matters is, you know, how big is your error? It has a term that is the coefficient of the, you know, the sum coefficient multiplied by some derivative bound um, 
and multiplied by you know h to the power of, of you know h to the power of you know the, the order. And so if delta t, if this h is not actually going to zero, the size of this coefficient actually matters. Right? And knowing whether your runge cutter method is going to be good or bad is actually due to whether these coefficients are sufficiently large or sufficiently small. Now, there still is a reason to an extent to go start going to higher and higher order methods, because if you look at this, you know, the way that you do this, the building of your, of your runge cutter methods is to match Taylor series. And if you know your Taylor series approximations, you're dividing by one, you know, uh, you're multiplying by one over k factorial. And so, the, you know, the factorials get really large. And so these coefficients are decreasing in a sense. But if h is not necessarily small, this term is not necessarily going so fast. You know, it, 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 so it depends on, it really depends on how, fa how well you've matched this coefficient. So, you know, I'm not the first to make this observation. In fact, this is a, this is a very major observation that was made in the past. In fact, it led to what is one of the methods that people most use today, which is known as the Dorman Prince 4 5 method, right? So ODE 4 5 is not a fourth order Runge-Kutta method, like people say in their classes sometimes. It's a fifth order Runge-Kutta method that also has a fourth order one embedded in it, and these are its Runge-Kutta tableau values, right? So you, you, basically, it's just a table of coefficients for a Runge-Kutta method that minimizes the local truncation error that those coefficients of the term that are non-zero, the next set of terms, right? And so this is why it, you know, it, it's optimized those coefficients in 1980, and so therefore MATLAB, Optiv, Simulink, Python, Fortran, Java, C++, all are known to have this as their default method. Uh, of course, Wikipedia is wrong because we do not have this as the default method inside of, uh, uh, of OD, uh, the Julia libraries, and I'll tell you exactly why we chose to, not, to break this convention you know, five years ago. And the reason is because if you look at this tableau, you start to see that there's some exact zeros. And you go, uh, OK, yeah. Well, it says default choice there. Ah, uh, OK, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> But so when you look at when you start to look at this 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 tableau though you see that there's there's something wrong right you know like everyone has been accepting this method for years and years and years on on end but when you look at this tableau written out and you just go why are there exact zeros there what is the chance that you do an optimization problem over all of these different coefficients and the answer is to have exactly zero here. <laughs> So you dig into it and you actually look at the paper, you know, uh, and oh, did you see? It? If you look into the paper, you'll see that when they did this coefficient optimization, right? It should have it should have stood out to you immediately that oh, well, how did they get rational values for everything? Like optimization giving you rational values, that's really interesting, right? Well, in the, in the, what they did was they did this all by hand, right? Because this was 1980, so they they said, okay, these are the values we want to make big. Let's uh, let's let's look at all the ways that we get to our order coefficient values. Let's try to plot them on lines and try to pick some values to be our, min our maxima or minima. And oh, hey, you know, you know what would make this process a lot easier? If we made a few values equal to zero, yeah. If we just assume some values are equal to zero, then we have uh, some nice equations that have a single derivative or a single maximum value. We solve for the maximum value in these, in these coefficients, and they're all going to be rational in terms of each other. Fantastic, right? And so we've all gone with this, this for, you know, from 1980, right? This is the most commonly used method. 1980 until whatever, wherever, at 2016 when we started deciding to use something else, this one assumption that made the, the, the optimization a bit easier is what was baked into every single code. And so the first thing that you should ask is, you know, can we drop this assumption? And there's a paper that basically nobody read, uh, which is like, oh, hey, look, um, you know, the, the, those guys that have built the method that you all use, uh, you know, we, we could just like not do that simplifying assumption and uh, try to make an algorithm that's actually a bit more efficient. Because if these fifth order runge cut methods are the standard ODE 4, 5, and everywhere, wouldn't it be good if we could try to just make it a little bit better? And so someone did publish this in 2011. And uh, if you, you know, now in order to actually do this in, 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 without the simplifying assumption, they wrote a bunch of Mathematica code to do global optimization, and the values you get out are clearly not rational numbers. Well, to an extent, you can still say it's rational, but you know. But, but the key here is that you know, it, it's unfun, unclean mathematics, right? But this is the piece, you know, when we started digging into it, we're like, oh, hey, why is no one using this? 
right? And so we, we started you know, playing with it, plotting it and everything. And you can actually see this is the, the SIT5 method. This is the, the, uh, the original Dorman prints. And if you do this over, you know, the DP5 versus SIT5, you do this over and over and over, you see that there's a pretty clear you know, 25%, 30% performance gain. It's not the biggest thing in the world, but it shows you that this coefficient optimization getting better is actually very useful to making better OD solvers. And so this is why you know, we don't default to do pre-5. This is why I tell everyone SIT5 is our default, because if you do this over a large set of benchmarks, you see that you know, the, coefficients of, the coefficients of the leading truncation error are about 20% smaller than on do pre-5, and you see this result in the benchmarks. So that was kind of one of our first wins very early on working on this ODE solver thing. But then also when I went around, I was like, hey, this is super cool. It's also like, ah, but it's kind of a trivial difference, right? But you know, it's kind of funny because you know, this, this showed me that there's a lot of mathematics that's kind of gone out there that does not get looked at at all. Right? If, you, if you look at the paper today, this uh, paper from Citrus that, you know, that, that is this method, you look at it, it's cited 176 times today. Uh, 167 of the results happened since 2016, which is when we put it in the ODE solver library. And pretty much everybody who cited it, is, they'd say, we use this method from differentialequations.jl and Julia. Right, so there, there's gold mines out there in the literature. So you know, now you got to put your historian hat on and say, is there anything else going on that people have just missed, right? And if you if you start searching around, you find this uh, you, you find this really you know this is actually how it looks like you know it's got the yeah you know, the, the GeoCities look to it right uh, I just love this and you know so Jim Verner is one of the people who created some of the first Runge-Kutta method work and you know if you start digging around you search for his name he has his his, his personal website which is uh, this website written in you know it's got to be hosted by GeoCities still um, and you find that he just has all of these little like you know PDFs of Runge-Kutta pairs that he he started started deriving in 2013 after he retired, right? So he started writing down these Rangakata pairs that he didn't really tell anyone about. He just put them onto this website. And that was about the same time I was starting to work on ODE Solver. So I found this fascinating, right? Because, uh, you know, the, is, the thing is, he wasn't looking at, you know, just fifth order methods anymore. He's looking at eighth order methods with a seventh order pair. I won't explain the pair part yet. Um, but he's looking at these eighth order methods, and he's coming up with these optimization techniques to come up with, you know, very high order coefficients of things that are very large tableaus of, of numbers, right? And so the, your question is, well, he's using global optimizers and things these days. You know, people did look at high order Runge-Kutta methods before, you know, what I saw was Citrus showed that it improved a bunch. Now there's a whole lot more numbers to optimize. Does this help a lot? And if you look at it, you know, you see that, you know, if you want to look at the difference between like one of the older eighth order methods, this is Dorman Prince that, you know, the same people did the fifth order method, they did an eighth order method. This GP8 is around here. And if you look at things like, you know, Vern 7, Vern 8, Vern 9, you see that on average you can actually get about a two times, three times improvement. And not only that, you get about a two times, three times improvement, but he still had to do simplifying assumptions. If you look at the tableau, there's a lot of zeros in there that don't need to exist, right? So, you know, someone in 2013 now, or yeah, around, around that time, you know, has created, you know, these methods for Vern 6, Vern 7, Vern 8, Vern 9, and we showed that they're, hey, you know, even just explicit Runge-Kutta methods can get about, you know, two times, three times better in terms of the perform the time it takes to hit a given error um, if you're to make use of these tableaus in the right way. And you know, of course, it took uh, MATLAB about five years later. So in 2021, MATLAB caught on like, oh, we need OD78. It's a Werner's most efficient pair and everything. So now you start to see it all around. But that's this is this is the history of where it came from. It was kind of a non-seen result of something that you know you really have to kind of follow the mathematical thread to to, to find and really dig out. So literally, ten it took ten years from the, you know the time that this person put it to their website before it was ever into you know a math, math lab software. I mean, we, we did it pretty quickly, but you know. But so, so you know, let's go back to this, uh, this, this slide then. You know, what, why are high order runge cutter methods not used more often, right? I think that the first thing is that it's kind of, order is a bad framing, right? You know, what you really care about is to use the methods that give you the biggest steps at the error that you want, right? And, and actually, I think I kind of uh, glossed over something that then describes when you want to know how to use your, your, your methods, right? Because as you, um, 
I think that, the, yeah, so th this, this actually displays it well. So as you want a lower and lower error, your adaptivity algorithm will take smaller and smaller time steps. As it takes smaller and smaller time steps, then the, the, the higher error or the higher order matters more. And so here's the fifth order method. When you have very large error that you, uh, that you, you know, if you don't care about error too much, the fifth order method is fine. But as you start decreasing your tolerance, the time it takes to hit the same error value will take more for a low order method than a high order method, right? So it's actually a function of what tolerance do I care about? And, am I, and also, have, has anyone at that order of method done enough optimization to the tableaus? So why do people not use uh, Fegan's uh, fourth or 14th order tableau? We have it implemented inside of differentialequations.jl. It does not benchmark as well as some of the Werner methods because you can see that it has not done as, as much uh, uh, truncation error optimization. If you look at the size of its leading truncation error terms, it's larger than the ones that Werner had found. And so even though the order is higher, it doesn't give you a real difference in the end. And then I really find this, this fact funny because this is actually one I heard in, in graduate school as well, right? I also heard people say, you know, in PDEs, a higher order accuracy scheme for, te for time uh, makes no sense if space is worse, right? And you're like, oh, if I use the second order finite difference, then the best you can do is the second order in time. But now, if you, you know, with this talk, the framing should tell you, like, no, that, that makes no sense, right? Order isn't what matters. The time, the amount of computation to hit the error that you want is what matters. So you should, it doesn't matter what you do in terms of the spatial accuracy, you choose whatever temporal method gives you the fastest computation to the order, to the order of accuracy, you know, to the, to the tolerance that you're trying to hit, right? So it's kind of interesting that, you know, this, this idea of why are we not using Runge-Kutta methods more often, I would say at this point, it's because the last person optimized these tableaus still left a bunch of zeros in there, and there's still a lot more optimizations to do in the eighth order tableaus. And if you actually benchmark them, the Werner methods are actually better in a lot of cases, and people just haven't adopted them yet. So, so there's kind of this lag. I don't know if it's like mathematical historianism or something. Like there's this lag between what people actually do and the mathematics that would actually be good for computation. Um, and that also doesn't account for all of the difference. So what else? You know, why, why, how do we also not just get a mathematical change, but what are some of the computational things that mattered? Well, this is where we need to bring in the second row, right? So if you have one of these Runge-Kutta methods, this first row is the linear combination of the Ks that give you the fifth order method, right? But it's ODE 4 or 5, you know, the, what does the 4 mean? Well, there's a linear combination here that gives you a fourth order method, and the difference between them is an error estimate. And this is used in your adaptivity, right? So how does adaptivity work in a nutshell? Instead of just doing one linear combination, you do two different linear combinations. The difference between them is what we call EST, right? Um, and then what we do is we do some kind of calculation, ES to some power, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to skip over the fact, just say it's a PI, it's a, you know, this is a PI uh, controller in, in a sense, right? But you do some computation to calculate Q, and then your new H is, a, is a, just Q times H. The key here, though, that you need to know is that there is a, there's a floating point exponential that happens in here, right? Um, and if you actually look at this, you see that you know, not all CPU operations are created equal. And so here we have, you know, this is how fast you can do an AND or an OR. You can actually do multiple plus operations and such per, per cycle. You know, there's a lot of things, simple operations can be super fast, while a lot of other operations are not fast. You know what happens to be an operation that's not fast? Exponentiation of floating point numbers. And so if you actually go into the, if you actually go in and profiled all these Runge Kutta methods on three ODE systems, four ODE systems, you'll see that the most expensive part of the calculation was not the Runge Kutta method, but was actually spending all of its time doing a floating point uh, power, power calculation. And why? Well, because programming languages bake in a floating point power calculation that is 16 digits of accuracy. And so we're using that inside of a PI adaptive heuristic to 16 digits of accuracy as our slowest piece of code. This is why not you see the fast math here, because, well, first of all, inside of differential equations, when we noticed this, we said, well, that makes no sense. My ODE solve is not even solving to 16 digits. So why is my heuristic to 16 digits? So we changed that to a floating point calculation that was less exact. And eventually, that actually became the, one of the fast math versions in Julia, it based itself thanks to Oscar. And so now what we were doing is it, that actually completely eliminated that from the computation as a major factor, right? And so it really took some thinking to go, well, this, this part of the algorithm doesn't matter, so why are we calculating it to, to such accuracy? 
And you know, with those kinds of optimizations, that's where we're able to hit this part where we say, where we kept coming out with the pharmacometric software, where we say, oh, we we're able to beat these Fortran methods, right? Because we have all these extra new tools, our new ODE solvers with our new optimizations do so much more better, right? And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I, w I was wondering how far in this I'd be able to get. Uh, I do want to make sure I could get to the, to the stiff part, because literally, I've only talked about explicit Runga-Kutta methods, right? The methods that everyone says were done in 1980. And uh, there you go, that's, that's already enough. But, you know, and so are the, what are there other things to do? Well, I, I want to go very quickly and say, well, if you, if you see all this story and you, and you know that uh, stochastic ODEs exist, you might go, well, there's stochastic Runga-Kutta methods. Do something similar. Right? Well, in, uh, what we did find from users is that the stability in stochastic Runge-Kutta methods have matters more. So if you come up with a stability function for your Runge stochastic Runge-Kutta method, you optimize that. I actually slapped it on a computer, optimized it for a year and a half. I, did, I built a computer, let it optimize this thing for a year and a half, and it spat out Runge-Kutta tableaus that were able to have about three times as much stability region as the other things, and you know it would end up being a whole lot faster, right? And then I submitted it to publication, and I had someone tell me this isn't math. I submitted it to a second place, and they gave me a paper award, right? So, you, you know, so it's, it's whatever. It's whatever. I don't know if this is math, right? Um, but let me end the story by talking about the, the, the stiff ODE solver choice in Puma. So that was just the explicit runga cut of methods, right? And then when, you start to, when I started going to the stiff case, everyone just said everything is always a BDF method, right? This is a big elephant in the room. Uh, you want to know it's a BDF method? It's gear, LSODE, VODE, CVODE, DASL, DASKER, IDA, ODE15S, like almost every single software out there is a BDF method, right? And so we decided to choose a non-BDF method for the pharmacometric stuff. Why do we do that? You know, what, what was our hipster reason here to be super different about it? Um, so the, the key is that BDF methods end up being very good for large equations because they exploit a trick in the Newton solve, right? When you do have, when you have an implicit so, uh, equation that you want to solve, you do a Newton's method, and it turns out you don't actually have to do Newton's method with taking a new Jacobian every time. You can reuse the same Jacobian over and over. And if you reuse that factorization, you don't get quadratic convergence anymore, but you also don't have to do O of n cubed factorizations all the time. So by keeping this factorization, you reuse it in the next step, you reuse it in the next step. That's how people have found that BDF methods can be optimized for large equations. But we're solving small equations, so we thought, oh, not only that does, does that not matter, but we can also look at methods that don't even have an implicit solve anymore. The issue with them is that th these methods exist, but they require an accurate Jacobian. So nobody put them in their software before because finite difference did not give you accurate enough Jacobians for these methods to hit the order of accuracy that would be required. And I just gave a talk yesterday on how we use automatic differentiation everywhere. So if you put this together, there's like, oh, there's these other methods that no one uses because you need accurate Jacobians, and we have a way to get accurate Jacobians. What happens if we piece these together? And so, you know, I want to get the highest order method. So you 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 dig into Herrer's book, you find that there's a mention of Rodos 5, that would be the highest order one that was ever made. You find out that there was no paper ever written on it. So you go email people around until they find this old uh, thesis that was written only in French. But it has this tableau around. If you, if you grab this and you benchmark it with a, only with automatic differentiation, it does it actually do better, right? It does a whole lot better than a lot of these other methods for these very small five or less, you know, twenty or less stiff ODEs. It's like a five times improvement. And so, actually, you know, so you know, even then, the, oh, that fifth order method, because it was just someone's uh, master's thesis, had a few issues in it. So, someone th in this last year actually improved it a bit to kind of be now the method that we are using in the end. And and there's one last piece, which is that you know, in in when you start, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to have dosing and all this st other stuff going on, the multi-step property of a BDF method assumes that you have no discontinuities in your past, and when you break that, the BDF method has to take a bunch of steps because it has to restart from the first first order one every time, right? So you put all of these pieces together, and then it says, well, we can blow it out of the water by using these high order, coefficient optimized, you know, Rodos methods that no one, no one even knew existed, and the paper wasn't even online, right? And you know, if you look at then the performance difference that we get from the ODE solvers, you bring it to, you, then you look at the performance difference that we have in terms of like the actual pharmacometrics use cases, you see that it carried on all the way over. 
And so, you know, in the, at the end of the day, this is what got, you know, uh, Moderna and such to be using Pumas as their go-to tool uh, uh, in, in, in for the COVID-19 vaccine. And so at the end of the day, I, I, this work was the work of pharmacology, right? And so at the, my, my, my point here at the end is that, you know, there was no novel ODE methods in this talk. I mean, okay, there was the SDE part, right? But there was no novel ODE methods in this talk. There are no big equations either. Everything is 10 ODEs or less, no HBC, no theorems. So therefore, thank you for coming to my talk on software engineering. <laughs> I assume that it's set to some new like set accuracy. Like, right? is there some kind of method that we can use for like setting a like a particular tolerance for these kinds of uh, mathematical operations? Would that like give us the ability to have kind of a sliding scale of accuracy versus time for floating point operations? Yes and no. So uh, we we've thought about this before, saying, oh hey, you know, if you're trying to solve your ODE to you know one e eight, then should we should you have a floating point uh, carrot that is you know uh, eight digits of accuracy, and you know should you be changing out that operation depending on the ODE tolerance, right? Um, the answer ends up being, well, it's also just a heuristic because it's just a PI adaptive controller. And so its output barely matters. Like it matters to like one digit of accuracy, two digits of accuracy. So as long as you choose a, a version of, of that calculation that is cheap enough to not show up, but also to not show up in the profile, but also be stable, you're good. So it just doesn't have to be precise. It just has to be fast and stable. <laughs> <laughs>